Man. Television is arguably the most powerful institution in the world. But how does television work? What is the business model and structure that dictates the way that power is used? And what impact does it have on our lives and our culture? This video will ask these questions and then discuss the potential for a more diverse, more democratic model that can be found in public access television and the new exciting potentials that exist on the internet. We'll first take a look at how mainstream television works. Who runs it? And why do they run it this way? What effect does it have on the way information moves around and what groups or ideas get excluded? Next, we'll see how public access television works. Who runs it? And in what ways does it differ from the corporate television model? Why is public access important? Lastly, we'll look at what's happening in the world of the media. The technologies are changing fast, and with them come new opportunities for structures and systems that bring incredible potential for making public access more viable and more powerful than ever before. So how does corporate television work? Corporate TV is a business, and like any business, there are three main components. There's a buyer, a seller, and a product. So who are the buyer and seller, and what is the product? Somehow people have gotten confused to think that the television corporations are the sellers, the TV shows are the product, and the audience at home is the buyer. But this isn't quite right. When you sit down to watch a sitcom or football game on TV, the network you're watching isn't making their money from you. Even if you pay for cable, the real money comes from the commercials. People in the media industry will tell you that their business is selling audiences to advertisers. So it's true that the television corporations are the sellers, but the buyers are advertisers, and the product that they're buying is you. It's not just broadcast television. The same is true for radio, newspapers, magazines, even the internet. Because the companies that run those services make the vast majority of their money by selling your eyeballs to advertisers. Promotions must be sold to the public. Yes, it really pays to advertise. There's nothing inherently evil about this model, but it does have some major structural flaws that can have a huge negative effect on our world. To examine this, let's suppose you own a newspaper in this part of Denver. It includes Lodo, where the average household income is $100,000 per year, and Five Points, where the average household income is $35,000 per year. Like most media institutions, you get the vast majority of your income from the sale of advertisements. You start out printing stories that appeal to people in both neighborhoods, but your advertisers would rather you tailor your content to draw readers in Lodo, where the amount of disposable income is magnitudes larger than that of Five Points. Even if your editor is a good, honest person who cares about both neighborhoods, and even if the advertisers don't directly request that you favor stories about Lodo over those about Five Points, that is probably what will happen. The readers your advertisers want to reach are those in Lodo, so you print more stories and articles that Lodo readers are interested in, and as a result, the people in Five Points start to recognize that your paper doesn't reflect their concerns. This is what happens on a larger scale in Denver and across the nation. The same is true for television. All forms of corporate media following this advertising model end up favoring the concerns of communities with money and neglecting the concerns of those without. Remember that the vast majority of the media that we see and hear is controlled by just a handful of massive corporations, many of whom are the very same corporations trying to sell us their products through advertising. And remember that for the most part, these corporations are run by wealthy, white men. Even if they are good, honest people who care about the world, the system is inherently biased to favor those in control. The United States is an exceedingly diverse country. There are so many races, religions, languages, philosophies, family structures, political outlooks, sexual identities, economic classes, and more. This is the very thing that makes our country so great. One would assume that television programming in the U.S. would be just as varied, but it isn't. It often feels like this is the result of personal prejudices among the ranks of those that control the media, 
but the problem is actually much larger and more systemic than this. Let's look closer. TV shows are expensive. Networks are able to cover the costs of making and distributing their content by what is known as an economy of scale. What this means is that rather than making a unique show that focuses on the events and people from each individual community, shows are designed to appeal to as many people as possible, so they can be broadcast nationwide, allowing advertisers to reach the most viewers. The price of producing one program is paid for through this mass market approach. Magnitudes cheaper than producing programs for each individual interest group, racial group, economic status, and so on. This is how networks make a profit. Remember that the audience is the product. So the larger the audience for a given program, the more valuable the advertising time is during that show. If a TV show, be it entertainment, documentary, even the news, is not embraced and viewed by enough consumers, advertisers will not pay to place ads in that show, and thus TV networks cannot afford to broadcast it. For this reason, unpopular shows, even unpopular information, will never have a place in mainstream media. So not only do poorer communities get ignored, but alternative and minority groups are largely left out as well. In order to create an alternative media system that truly represents the diversity of America, we need a new model. A new approach that frees us from the biases and constraints of the advertising model, and a new, more distributed ownership structure that includes all communities. Everyone understands the danger of allowing the government to have complete control over the media. We live in a democratic society, and democracy can only work if the voters are able to make informed decisions. We've seen from history what can happen when the government itself is in control of the information voters receive. Fewer people, unfortunately, understand the danger of allowing corporations to have complete control over the media. We live in a capitalist society, and capitalism can only work if the consumers are able to make informed decisions about their purchases. When the companies that control the primary sources of information in society are the very same organizations trying to sell us their products, they're able to decide what messages do and do not get heard. They manipulate the market, and capitalism suffers. Your mouth feels clean, your throat refreshed. Why don't you switch from hots to the snow fresh coolness of cool. As cool and as clean as a breath of fresh air. Filter cool. In the early 1970s, when the cable television industry was new and growing quickly, the government recognized these and other shortcomings of the model and set out to make some rules to ensure that television not only satisfied the advertisers, but also served some basic social needs. This was the birth of public access television. The government knew that the cable television companies would be using public infrastructure, paid for with our taxes, to conduct their business. Things like running cable on power lines and public land. This means that private companies would be able to profit by using things that everyone owns. Media visionaries worked with the FCC and later Congress to require cable television companies to provide three kinds of non-commercial channels to the communities they were operating in. The goal wasn't to eliminate the corporate media model, but to ensure that a small portion of our cable channels be reserved for important content that they knew the advertising model could never support, including local government, educational, and a third type of non-commercial channels called public access. With subsequent laws, it was determined that these PEG channels would be funded by the cable conglomerates, municipal governments, or a blend of both. Ideally, public access is an inclusive, content-neutral, free speech conduit with training, equipment access, and broadcast opportunities for everyone in the community. And all of this is free, or very low cost. Public access television was the first real opportunity for unique programming, uncommon points of view, or unpopular shows serving smaller segments of the population to get onto television. In this model, there is no need to question whether a program will bring profits to advertisers. Thus, public access provides an alternative avenue that is not vulnerable to the inherent biases and restrictions of the corporate model. 
Today, support for public access TV seems to be falling. Where the cable companies once had to provide the public access staffing and facilities themselves, now they are only required to set aside a small portion of their revenues for PEG programs. Furthermore, some governments like Denver are tempted to use PEG funds for government technology needs rather than supporting public access operations. As a result, we're left with a public access television system made up of thousands of small, disconnected, and underfunded organizations struggling to stay relevant in a changing world and accomplish the goals for which they were created. Today's media landscape is changing fast. Like never before, there's an opportunity to transform public access TV into a more viable, more powerful tool. The mantra of TV and film in the past was, content is king, distribution is queen, meaning that the power is in the hands first of the people who make the media, and second, those who control distribution. 20 years ago, you needed a team of trained people and hundreds of thousands of dollars to make a film. Today, armed with a $200 digital camcorder and a basic home computer, anyone has the tools they need to make a film. And with websites like YouTube and Archive.org, you can get your work seen by millions for free. Take, for example, this music video, created in 2006 by the band OK Go. One of the most popular music videos of this decade, it was produced on a consumer digital video camera for a cost of just a few thousand dollars, mostly treadmill restocking fees. Posted for free on the internet, the video quickly spread to over 20 million views on YouTube alone a viewership rivaling the initial broadcasts of MTV's top video of the 80s, Michael Jackson's Thriller. Thriller, however, was produced at a cost of almost $1 million. Media distribution is moving to the internet, and it's important for us to understand how the use of the internet is undergoing a radical transformation. In the early years of the internet, the vast majority of use was one-to-one -one communication. Through 1995, just under 10% of all internet traffic was email. About 25% consisted of FTP, or one-to-one -one file transfers. And together, all forms of one-to-one -one communication made up nearly 90% of all internet traffic. In the late 1990s, the various websites that we've all come to know began dominating internet traffic in one-to-many communication. Like the mass media, internet use was becoming controlled by centralized organizations disseminating information to the masses. By the late 90s, the majority of internet use was no longer one-to-one -one communication, but one-to-many. Around this time, a new use of the internet showed up on the charts. Something called peer-to-peer, -peer, or many-to-many -many traffic began with Usenet, Napster, and Nutella. These and other websites and networks facilitating many-to-many -many communication became the fastest growing segment of internet traffic. Today, many-to-many -many communication is the primary use of the internet and still growing. This graph shows three of the top websites of the 1990s, Passport.net, AOL, and Go.com. By the late 90s, they started getting surpassed in traffic rank by little companies, sometimes referred to as Net 2.0 companies. First was eBay, then Wikipedia, Craigslist, MySpace, YouTube, and the list keeps going. Until as you look at today's top 25 websites on the internet, as ranked by Alexa.com, at least half of them are tiny, young, net 2.0 companies facilitating this new, user-automated, many-to-many kind of communication. When you look at the staff size of these companies, even today, they are on average less than one one-hundredth the size of their more traditional counterparts. Instead of relying on a team of staff developers and writers to create the content on their sites, they allow the public to create, categorize, and find the content they want. Small public access stations can use this model to transform TV in much the same way other forms of media have. A dramatic example is the effect weblogs, or blogs, have had on written media. There are approximately 60,000 newspaper organizations worldwide. In comparison, there are over 60 million blogs, the Internet's version of a newspaper, with over 10 million blog articles published every day. These blogs are not written by paid journalists, but by interested people just like you and me. 
on topics ranging from healthcare to local politics, from movie reviews to personal stories. It's hard to sift through all this information to find the few sources that reflect the topic or the quality you are looking for as a reader. It's reminiscent of the early days of the web, when prior to Google, it was often difficult to find anything good, reliable, or to find what you were specifically looking for. But then Google largely used our link patterns, our search results, and our behavior to help make their search engine work better. In much the same way, this site, Technorati, depends on users to rate, tag, and categorize the vast expanse of the blogosphere, handing a task that no newspaper editor in the world could take on to millions of people who read blogs. The end result is that Technorati could take the top-rated blogs each day as ranked by the community, print the best 0.01%, that's one out of every 10,000 blogs, and print you a custom newspaper every day that is twice the size of the New York Times. This is the model for public access. With as many as 3,000 access stations across the U.S., we collectively produce tens of thousands of hours of content every single day. If access stations were to do with that content what Google did to the web, or what Technorati has done to the blogosphere, we could organize all this user-driven content in a way that would allow viewers to find what they want. If we wanted to pick the top one hour out of every 10,000 hours of content produced in public access stations across the country, you'd have more original programming each day than any network in the world. And every viewer could essentially have their own TV station filled with the shows they want to see. In order for public access stations to take full advantage of the incredible potential that these trends represent, there are a few steps that we need to take right away. First, all content must be made digital. Digital broadcast servers are cheaper and easier to automate, removing your need for a programming director to load tapes and making it possible to exchange shows via the web. Two, Creative Commons. Traditional copyright has no place in public access programming. The work produced in public access is non-commercial, aimed at spreading alternative perspectives as widely as possible, and copyright only gets in the way of that. Creative Commons allows us to get the message out while still protecting producers from being taken advantage of by commercial interests. 3. Everything needs to be web accessible. Once our public access stations are online, a whole new world is open that lets us put the power of the media in the hands of the people. 4. Rating and categorization. We need to let viewers watch, rate, tag, and categorize content on the web. A small group of pioneers in public access have already invested thousands of hours and hundreds of thousands of dollars in the development of free, open source, web-based tools to manage every aspect of this process. But there's one last hurdle, and it's one that isn't so easily passed. Remember this map? Over 90% of individuals living in wealthy neighborhoods and communities in the U.S. have access to the internet. But in poorer communities, that percentage drops to just over 50%, a rift referred to as the digital divide. Remember that access stations are in the business of providing technical equipment and skills to communities who have traditionally lacked those resources. The line between the media and the internet blurs more every day. And today, bringing the power of the media to your community means more than teaching them how to use a camera. It means computer literacy. So, the fifth component, closing the digital divide. Computer and internet access and education must be at the forefront of the mission of every public access station. Denver's new public access TV station, Denver Open Media, is among the first public access stations to embrace this new model wholeheartedly. In 2005, Denver City Council shut down the city's old public access station and issued a request for a new vision for public access that could succeed without the general operating support they had once provided. Deproduction, a local nonprofit media production and education organization, responded. And in December of 2006, Denver Open Media flipped the switch on this revolutionary new model for public access TV. A lot of the government funding and public funding for public access is definitely disappearing. 
So we had to find ways to kind of leverage a really small amount of money, a small staff, and a small amount of capital equipment to have the greatest impact possible on, on Denver and on the country. So the model we're trying to emulate is companies like Wikipedia that just have five staff members and yet have an encyclopedia that's more popular and more used than Encyclopedia Britannica or Microsoft Encarta. A small staff that's just focused on setting up the tools and the resources that the public needs to do what the public wants to do. So the company kind of just gets out of the way. Uh, that's what we're doing here. It's not the organization, you know, spewing their rhetoric to the people. It's, it's an organization that's just facilitating people communicating with each other because that's what the people want, that's what the market wants. I think Denver Open Media's model fosters a greater sense of community because, because it is user-driven. Um, community members are going to come in here and really have to rely on one another. They're going to have to help each other and that in itself will just foster a greater sense of community and ownership. The mission of Deep Production, the organization behind Everoak Media, is to put the power of the media into the hands of the people. With these new automated systems that we've developed through our website, we're really hoping to make that a reality. We really want producers to be driving the station, and hopefully through that model, we'll get a lot more participation. We want people excited, we want people to take ownership, to really feel like they own the station. So the automated user model, or the automated programming model, there's two purposes for it. There's the kind of sexy purpose, which is like to get the users and the community involved with getting their media on the air. They become a part of the process. The more practical reason is that it eliminates the need for human resources to operate the station. So by having uh, users ingest their own content, that eliminates the need for people to fill those roles. The website's also offering a few more traditional services. Um, we allow you to register for classes online. You can sign up for and reserve equipment and the studios here at the station. In the future, we're going to actually allow producers to ingest content from home. There's a real push to use the latest technology and to use open source technology. And so what we create here can be used at some other station, at some other level, you know, anywhere. So in developing all the tools and the model that we need to make the station work on the limited resources that we have, we were working with a few of the leading public access stations in the country. Together we've invested over $100,000 in building this tool set that will allow any public access station to adopt the pieces that they want include them in their model and start collaborating with us and the other public access stations so that we can start acting like a large network of stations instead of like tiny independent isolated stations. There's so many disenfranchised groups um, and usually these people don't get heard from. They don't have any way of getting their voice out there and getting their opinions out there. Um, and what's exciting to me about this is that they can do that. They can come in here and for you know very little cost. Um, they can get the training and the tools to be able to have a voice in media. It feels incredible to me to walk into this space every day and have two huge studios and green screens and lights and cameras and it, it shocks me every day I come in here what we have to offer. We want everyone in the community to have a voice in media but we want it to be as eloquent a voice as possible so we train people to be able to make the most high quality video they can make. We offer classes in field production, classes in studio production, and classes in editing. People learn how to use a camera. Um, they learn basic lighting setup, um, audio setup, and cinematography um, so they can make their own shows and make their own shows better. Once they're certified in this equipment, members have access to all the equipment that we have here. Public access in general is just really exciting because it's basically the last place left in this country that is truly going for your First Amendment rights. The government at the federal, state, and local levels are um, being put in a position by the big telecommunications companies to basically end the funding for public access. So my number one hope right now is that it continues to be more and more and more entrenched in the community so that you know if that ever did happen, the community just wouldn't let it go away. What I look forward to happening in the next year is more people realizing that they have access to this equipment and these resources. I think once everybody is allowed to have an equal voice in media, um, I think that's, to me, that's revolutionary. In the United States, people spend more time watching TV than all other forms of leisure activity combined. 
for better or worse, it is where we are most often exposed to the values of our society. Public access provides an open, democratic alternative to the advertising model, giving us all a chance to shape that picture. There is a significant societal benefit when we engage all communities. Public access fulfills the basic human need to communicate and engage with one's community in a way that isn't limited by the financial profitability of your message. Cable companies use public resources to make a profit and should continue to help cover the costs for encouraging this widespread engagement through public access TV. Current media and technology trends are creating an ideal opportunity to bring non-commercial TV into a new realm of significance. Most people would be amazed at how easy it is to make their own TV show, and also amazed at the freedom and individual control that public access allows. People can put almost anything on public access TV. Following the lead of today's internet innovators, we can apply a user-driven approach and enable our communities to mold TV into an institution that fulfills public and social needs. This vision requires that we all stop just consuming and start taking an active role in the media. If you have an access station in your area, start a show and work with them to implement some of these tools. If you don't, look into starting one. And regardless of where you live, there is local and national legislation that threatens public access TV in your area. Write your legislators and encourage them to protect the few free speech outlets that still exist. We can all work together to put the power of the media in the hands of the people. Thank <laughs> you.